This image of Juanique Horn Miller, stabbed in the chest by a Canadian soldier holding her four-year-old sister, went viral before going viral was a thing. It happened during the Oka crisis, a standoff that lasted 78 days. It was a bloody day at the Mohawk Indian community in Oka, Quebec. It all began when the town of Oka planned to expand a golf course on territory natives consider sacred. When a band of Mohawk warriors set up a blockade, chaos ensued and a Quebec police officer was killed. The army was called in. From here on in, I guess we're gonna be burying each other. Horn Miller was just 14 at the time. Sports was her salvation. Sport literally saved my life. She considered quitting after the stabbing. Coming close to death like that, you kind of go, okay. But instead became even more focused. There it is. In 1999, she represented Canada at the Pan Am Games. Canada wins the first gold medal in Pan Am water polo. And in 2000, competed at the Sydney Olympics. That was when Ecorn Miller crashing the nets. <laughs> She's still an activist involved in today's native rights movement. Still inspiring others in sports too. No longer competing, she was Canada's assistant chef de mission at this summer's Pan Am Games in Toronto. I sat down with Juanique Horn Miller yesterday in Toronto. Lovely to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Oka, 25 years ago. Some people say it was sort of the beginning of awareness, really, in Canada about yeah. native rights issues. I wonder, I don't know more is a big deal now. Yeah. Um, do they know about Oka? Do they? <laughs> yes. Do, do they look back and honor people like you, though? You know what? I don't know more is um, is a, is a phenomenal movement. I mean, Oka happened at a time when you know before social media and it spread like wildfire. It was a time, it was important for this country to go through that. It was painful, but they had to be shaken into you know, um, a consciousness that indigenous issues were important. They were important because as long as we ignore them, they were gonna fracture the foundation of this country, always. And um, it was the first time in history that native issues had been were every front page of every newspaper. They headlined every newscast for 78 days. So you couldn't ignore it anymore. The average Canadian was like, what? What are these indigenous issues, right? And then you were stabbed. Tell me about that. How on earth did that happen? Well, it was at the very end of the crisis uh, that we had made a decision to come out of the treatment center. And um, we started to walk out. And we were singing a, a traditional song, I remember, it was a unity song. And my little sister, I was holding her hand and- She was four. She was four, and I was trying to keep her calm. And when we got to the front gate, rather than going out those gates, we decided to take a, a right-hand turn along the barbed wire. And uh, people started to pour out onto the, onto the road. And I remember just the soldiers just coming and just freaking out and attacking certain warriors. They had people they wanted to get and just fights breaking out, just like violence and chaos. And in that chaos, other people scooped up the other kids and started to run out and try to get them you know, to safety. And I remember hanging on like my, my little sister's hand and she, <laughs> sorry, yeah. you know, she, I, I'm a mother now. And I'm a mother and I know, I know cries, I know, I know what they sound like. I know what it sounds like when somebody is, when a child is scared or hungry or tired. But there was a sound that she started making that was so terrified like she was going to die. And it's a special sound that she just looked at me and her eyes were big and filled with tears and f her face was filled with terror. And she just started to scream and scream. And I can just, I can still hear it. And I looked at her and I, I just said, I gotta get her out of here. And there was a, a young soldier standing there and he looked terrified. He was frozen solid. And I looked at my sister and I said, he's not gonna hurt us. He's not gonna hurt us. And he let me walk out onto the highway and um, I was pushing, and I pushed my way to the media barricade. And when I got there, I recognized a soldier. And I remember him from a couple weeks earlier not allowing my school books in. And when I got there, I remember saying, I know you. And I, I pointed at him, and I pulled my sister behind me. And then suddenly I got hit in the chest. And 
it was like the wind was knocked out of me, kind of that feeling on a, on a schoolyard when you get punched in the chest. And I went, I kind of bent forward and then someone kicked my feet out from underneath me. And my little sister, I grabbed her to protect her. And, um, you know, I don't really remember that sequence, uh, like, like a full sequence. I remember it like snapshots. Psh, psh, psh. Like I remember lying on the ground and seeing cameras and seeing light and seeing the soldier. It's all shots like that. And I didn't quite understand why until many years later when I went to see a PTSD therapist, she said, you were in such terror. And I, you know, that picture, you can see my face. I am in, I'm in a, so much pain, terror, and fear at the same time that my mind is just shutting down and, and trying to protect me. So it really changed you. Because for a while, it sounded like you were trying to hide away <laughs> yeah. afterwards. Yeah, I really did. I had horrible PTSD. So nightmares and anxiety attacks and shaking. I remember just shaking. You couldn't, I couldn't hang on to anything. And for, for days and days, I stayed in my room. I covered my windows up with blankets. Mm -hmm. you know. And um, my mom, she let me sit in that room for six days. I only came out to go to the washroom, get food, and go back in. And on the sixth day, she came in and she sat down on my bed and she asked me, so what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. I don't know. I, I want to stay in this room. I'm safe here. And uh, I just don't want to go anywhere. And she said, well, no one would ever blame you, you know, for staying here. You know, but she actually reminded me of this dream I had since I was a kid to be, to be an Olympic athlete. And, you know, I had, I was starting to show signs of that. You were a champion age, swimmer already. I was yeah. already a provincial champion in swimming. I had city records in running. I was just starting water polo. I was showing that I was pretty good at water polo. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, well, you have this dream. And, and if you give up now, you're handing that dream over to that soldier. Hmm. And for the rest of your life, you're going to be his victim. She, so. so she said, well, you know, I'll support whatever you decide. Just let me know what you want to do. And she started walking out of the room. And then she turned around and stared at me. And she said, but you remember, I never raised you to be anybody's victim. And then I, she walked out of the room. And I was like, by that statement, I went, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, not fair, but it was what I needed to hear. I needed to hear that I didn't want to be anybody's victim. I just, I, I couldn't live with that. And so, you know, I went back to water polo. Two weeks after, I went back to school. Um, I really threw myself into sports. It was became what I self-medicated with. And, um, and 10 years later, I was at the Olympics. But you had a lot of anger. Yeah. But you funneled it into sports? Yes. I mean, I funneled it. I was known when I played for being quite aggressive. <laughs> 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 I was known for that. I was known for being, you know, like I brought my culture uh, that warrior side of me into my sport and I, I was known for being very aggressive very protective of my teammates and um, You know and I became the co-captain of the team and um, Every time I wanted to quit every single time I thought about it and it was hard because I was entering a, a world where there were no indigenous people there was nothing within the sports system that reflected the world I came from and I faced racism I faced all those things and every time I wanted to quit I thought first and foremost my little sister, who watched every move I made, and I wanted to show her how to succeed. And I wanted to show her how, you know, you could go above and beyond what we went through together. And so I did it for her. She was my reason for never quitting. Do I you just, think Canadians better understand the fight? It used to be such a scary term, Mohawk warriors, you know, they're at the barricades. And are people understanding more about past injustices and, uh, well, and, and the need for a fight now? You know, it, 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 you could pick one issue off the shelf, murder and missing women, education, access to healthy food, clean water, safe roads. Like that is something that I think Canadians can get on board with. But, you know, I think that Canadians understand and what OCA will always remain as the worst case possibility hmm. if nothing is done. If nothing, if we continue along and we pretend it doesn't happen or, we're, or we try to say, well, it's, it's too expensive for us to, to deal with. And you know what? It's always a possibility. And people like me who experience that say, we don't want that again. And I will do everything I can to make sure that doesn't happen. And that includes getting involved with politics and 
you know, being being involved with the Canadian Olympic Committee to inspire Canadians to raise their voices with us and say, it's time we create a country that we truly all can be proud of 100%. There's this big debate now uh, within some Native communities as to whether to get involved in federal elections or to, to stick with sort of local politics. What do you think? You know, I come from uh, particularly uh, the Haudenosaunee people. We don't We've been raised not to vote, hmm. um, but uh, you so know. you don't vote. I have never voted in an really? election, but that's changing. Huh. Our population is growing. It is the fastest growing population in this country. We have the ability to be an incredible factor for change. You know, I think in this our lifetime we are going to see an Indigenous prime minister. I do believe it. It's been so nice to talk Thank to you. Thank you.